uh, for the next hour or so, we're all going to have a religious experience. Joel. Thank you, Brian, and Mother Earth News. You know what? It is such a treat to be among all these normal people. I mean, just walking through the trade show and seeing the, uh, the, the aquaponics, the mini gardens. Yesterday you had Will Allen uh, and, and, and you know, the people that say, can you really feed the world? I mean, can you believe there are still people that still ask, can you feed the world this way? I mean, see, see, normal food systems throughout history have been integrated food systems, not segregated food systems. And that's one of the critical differences right now uh, between our kind of thinking and the what I call the mechanical food system thinking is that it has grown up in this, you know, uh, Greco-Roman Western reductionist linear compartmentalized fragmented systematized <laughs> disconnected individualized democratized all about me kind of thinking. <laughs> and we come from an integrated, related, connected, holistic, it's all about us kind of thinking. And that's a, that's a big difference. That's a big difference. And, and the fact is that, that a lot of normal patterns throughout history held some of this ability to segregate in check over time. Our ability to segregate has been uh, uh, encouraged by a lot of recent, very, very recent developments, not the least of which is cheap energy and cheap transportation. Let me explain. Let's take grain, grain production. Throughout history, until extremely recent days, grain was always very expensive because grain is an annual not a perennial. And grain was always very, very expensive. Think about it. If in order to plant an annual, which requires tillage, you have to walk behind an ox or a yak or a water buffalo all day with a sharp stick, you know, you get to do this all day and then we get to turn around and go this way. Okay, and we're going to spend all day out in the hot sun walking behind the ox with a sharp stick. By the end of the day, we might have a place, you know, tilled up maybe the size of this stage. We get to go out and we, we scatter by hand, you know, some barley or rye or wheat or amaranth or whatever. We scatter that and um, then, you know, it sprouts, hopefully. And then if it gets some weeds in it, we have to go out, we have to, you know, pull the weeds, use a crude, kind of a crude hoe kind of thing to, to try to pull the weeds out. Then it finally grows up and we get to go out with a, some, with, with a scythe or a sickle and we get to cut it, right? And we've got to gather it up and put it with all the heads facing one direction in a shock, in a little, in a, in a, in a sheave, all right? We don't even have these words anymore. People, are, you know, people know a lot more about, you know, computer technology than this. It's like foreign language. Gather it up in a sheave and it stands there and cures out over a couple, three, four weeks while we do the rest of the harvest. This is a way to, to hold it, let it cure out. In fact, during that curing time, it actually gets damp and then dry and damp and dry as evening dews come on it and then the afternoon sun uh, um, uh, dries it out. And that, that gentle moisture and curing actually stimulates a very light, gentle fermentation in the seed head, which uh, creates digestibility for whatever eats it. 
One of the reasons we're having so much celiacs and gluten intolerance uh, in modern days is because now we go out with a combine, cut it, and within two hours it's in a natural gas dryer and doesn't have the time to go through that gentle fermentation curative process which releases lots of neat digestive enzymes. All right. So anyway, so we're going to put it in the sheave and then we're going to get it all, all harvested and then we're going to go, we're going to collect these sheaves, pick them up, put them on a wagon and take them to a threshing floor. Now this threshing floor might be just hard packed clay, it might be, you know, uh, crude uh, board planks laid out on, on the ground, it might be some crude kind of a limestone plaster, uh, you know, crude cement kind of thing. But anyway, we're going to put those sheaves on there and we're going to pound them out. We're going to maybe uh, walk a, an ox back and forth across them. Maybe we're going to take a, a heavy sticks and, uh, and we're all going to flail it. You've heard the word flail, okay? That's, that's where it comes from. We're going to beat on it to shatter the husks and let those grains uh, part from the husks. Or maybe we'll just, you know, call the local kindergarten and have all the kids come and play a game on top of it. Whatever. But anyway, we're going we're gonna to shatter those, those uh, husks, those heads, and then we're going to take a crude fork and we're going to go to a breezy area and we're going to fling this uh, up in the air, all this, it's called winnowing, all right? And the breeze is going to blow the light straw and husks over in a pile, and the heavy grain is going to fall to the floor. So at the end of all this process, we get to look, and there's some grain. <laughs> and we get to reach down, we kind of, you know, sweep it up, we gather it up very carefully. Now, somehow, we've got to preserve this till a whole year hence in a time and keep it away from from rats and mice in a time before sheet metal plastic fiberglass wire mesh what are you going to put it in clay pots and so historically cultures have had these giant giant clay pots that they put this precious grain in and guarded them with armed garrisons because it was so expensive and, and, and valuable. In fact, the, uh, the Old Testament book of Hosea, this is Sunday, we can talk about this, good. <laughs> the Old Testament book of Hosea talks about a harlot being sold for the price of nine and a half ephahs of barley, which is about two and a half bushels. It's not because harlots were cheap. <laughs> about as expensive as they are today. <laughs> but grain was expensive. And, and, and there simply was not enough of it to have the luxury of feeding it to any animal because people needed it for, their per, for, for baking, for their own personal consumption. You couldn't waste it on animals. And certainly not on herbivores. And the fact that all of this work and transportation moving around used draft animals, all draft animals are herbivores. And so, in a time of expensive grain and when, when tillage and transportation was laborious and slow and logistically inefficient, it meant that the ancient dietary foundations were always based on herbivores, seafood, and perennials. From vineyard to tree crop to herbivore, whether it's bison, yak, giraffe, cow, goat, llama, alpaca, sheep, okay, these are all herbivores. Elephants, uh, camels, Okay? They're all herbivores or seafood and perennials. Well, why? Because tillage was laborious and logistically slow and difficult. You simply couldn't, you couldn't till up that much ground. And so that is why the ancient diets were always heavily based in seafood, perennials, and herbivores. Well, what about the omnivores? We didn't have enough grain to feed the omnivores either. So what are you going to do about omnivores? Pigs and chickens. 
They're omnivores, right? Well, the way they were used, they were scavengers and recyclers. Pigs in the Iberian Peninsula, there in, in Spain, they, they, they developed a whole culture of the pigs running under the uh, acorn producing cork trees. The black footed hog that we, you know, that now commands a price of $1,000 a ham if you buy it at Salone del Gusto in Italy. Michael Paul and I were sitting there and sampling this, you know, this, this, this $100 a pound, uh, um, you know, black foot pork. Can you imagine a culture in which the guy that knows how to prune the cork tree to stimulate acorn production for the black-footed pig is regarded with as much reverence in the culture as a world-class heart surgeon? Wow. You know, believe it or not, that's normal. So, here we were, and, 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 and Michael, you know, he's eating and I'm eating, and he says, well, what do you think? I said, I don't think anything is worth $100 a pound, but anyway. <laughs> that's just my old frugal, uh, you know, frugal background. <laughs> anyway, these pigs grew up on the edges. They grew up in the peripheries. Um, acorns, uh, George Washington in early America, uh, Thomas Jefferson, all... They, they ate uh, American chestnuts until the blight came in 1900. Uh, my neighbors talk about how the community would get together and they invented, uh, back in ancient times, they invented this, this very intricate means of notching pigs' ears from that you could read pigs from one to a hundred. So every neighbor had a little notch in the ear, you know. Uh, you know, neighbor John has a, you know, has a, a, a middle notch in the right ear. And neighbor, you know, Smith has, you know, a, a, a low notch in the left ear. And by doing that, 10, 12 neighbors could, could put their hogs together, run them through the chestnut forest and the acorns, and then in the fall, they'd round them up. Everybody knew which hogs they were, and they would move from farm to farm having their Thanksgiving hog killings when the, when the weather got down. The reason that, that Virginia became known for country ham was not because Virginians were especially good at, you know, or, or loved ham or anything. Uh, it was because Virginia was the only state in, the early, in early America in which the temperatures were warm enough in the day to uh, make the, the pork... Uh, uh, weep enough to accept the cure but cold enough at night to keep it from getting warm enough in the day that it would rot before it took the cure. North Carolina was just a little too warm. Pennsylvania was just a little too cold. Pennsylvania during that, you know, it, it, when, it, when it started getting cold, it would get too cold and it would freeze and then it would stop taking the cure. North Carolina during the day would get too warm and the meat would rot before it took all the cure. So the, in a day before you could climatically control anything, Virginia was the only area that was that perfect balance of, of cool nights and warm enough days for the meat to actually take the cure. That's what built the Virginia, uh, Virginia pork industry. So, so pigs were fed on perennials around the outskirts in Switzerland. Uh, they were the way to handle all the whey from the, from the cheese. You know, again, you couldn't, n nobody would have shipped uh, liquid milk. I mean, you couldn't afford to ship water. It, it, sitting in an ox cart, it turned to butter, you know, by the time you got to town. So the only thing you could ship from a dairy was aged cheese. You had, to, you had to increase the nutrient density of food. The only thing that could be shipped was either very exotic food like citrus, you know, oranges and things, uh, or extremely uh, spicy kind of things, coffee, spices, tea, you know, lightweight but very uh, uh, pungent type of things, or extremely nutrient dense things, you know, like, like non-watery things. So you couldn't ship liquid milk. Believe me, when Daniel Boone went out to, to uh, look over Kentuck, uh, he wasn't dangling uh, fresh cucumbers and watermelons from his horse saddlebags. <laughs> he was taking dried fruits, nuts, and um, moldy cheese and jerky, all right? These were extremely nutrient-dense, non-water-based things. You, you simply cannot afford any time in history to transport things that are 96% water 1,500 miles. You, know, you just, it, 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 it's uh, illogical. Um, 
takes too much energy to transport that much water. So that, that was the pig. So the pigs uh, in Swiss society were just downhill from the cheese making, and so the, they would make the cheese with the with the cows, and then the whey would just run down into a slough into into where the pig trough was and the pigs ate the way. So the pigs have always been this kind of peripheral scavenger around the edges. What about chickens? What about poultry? Poultry was always right up next to the kitchen. And they got fed all the garden scraps, the blemished vegetables and fruit, and, and uh, all the kitchen scraps. And that's what fed the chickens. Cows were every man's food. They were the peasant food. Anybody could have a cow that had a blade of grass. But you couldn't have any more chickens than you generated kitchen scraps. And so chickens were a luxury. So when Harry Truman said his vision for America was a chicken in every pot, he was speaking in a day when chickens were still a luxury item and reserved for special occasions because their supply was limited by the flow of waste materials and recycling coming out of the food system. Right? Well, what have we done today with, for the first time in human civilization, being able to divorce ourselves from these historically normal um, um, constraints of difficult transportation and expensive energy is we have, for the first time, been able to segregate the sectors of our food system. So now no longer are we dependent on the flow of kitchen scraps to feed the chickens. Now we just buy cheap grain. Doesn't matter of course that this grain is desertifying the, the uh, planet, uh, dropping the aquifers, um, sending a, a dead zone the size of New Jersey into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, that doesn't matter. We've got this illusion of plenty that we're still mining from the soil that was built during an herbivorous perennial predator disturbance rest cycle for centuries. And sooner or later, we'll deplete that. You know, Iowa in the last hundred years has lost 50% of its topsoil. You know, there's an old Chinese saying that says if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to end up where you're headed. <laughs> yeah. My question is, if we've, if we've, if we've eliminated 50% of it in the last 100 years, what happens in the next 100? And that, that's the breadbasket of the world, if you will. All right. So, this, this, this segregated idea, I think, is critical for us to understand when we look to the future and say, well, what would an earth-friendly, what would uh, a, a system that honors our ecological umbilical, uh, the womb, the nest that we're in, what would a system look like? And so when we look at, at what has stood the test of time for centuries, if you will, the, the racehorse that's been winning the races for a long time before modern America, what you begin to see are patterns of integration. So what would that look like? Well, what it would look like is um, every kitchen in America having enough chickens to handle its kitchen scraps. If you don't have any land, get rid of the parakeet cage and the, and, and the, and the pet dog and the pet cat and the, and the aquarium and put in two chickens. They're a, they're a whole lot quieter and they'll lay eggs. You know, it's amazing today that we give greenie awards, for example, to college uh, dining services that have finally had their epiphany and put in a composting program to take the kitchen scraps out, put them in barrels, put them on a diesel truck, take them 10 miles out of town to a special composting facility so that they can import them back, the compost back, and put it on ornamental roses around the campus. <laughs> and they get a greenie award. No, no. The real greedy award is when the campus puts a little chicken house right behind the dining services. They take all the kitchen scraps into the chickens. They bring the eggs in. And now nothing has to go on a diesel truck, go to a composting site, or be exported or imported anyplace. You know, that 
is what we talk about when we say an integrated system. You know, never before in civilization have we been able to separate where the, you know, the grain is grown and the animals are grown and, the, and the, we've never been able to do that before. Never. In fact, you know, in the world today, on the planet, 50% of all the human animal food produced today on the planet never gets eaten by a person. It's blemished, it spoils, it the sell-by dates, you know, goes, it gets, uh, you know, hung up by a, you know, a, a, a warlord that won't let the Red Cross truck. The fact is, if I could snap my fingers today and double the planet's food supply, not another single person would be fed, and we are currently producing twice as much food in the world as we need. Twice as much. Nobody goes hungry because there's not enough food. Now, there's a lot of reasons, I'm not saying nobody goes hungry, okay? But they don't go hungry because there's not enough food. They go hungry because of distribution problems, because you know, maybe there's not a road over this, you know, uh, cliff or something. Uh, uh, again, maybe there's some, uh, you know, displaced person with an Uzi, you know, keeping the Red Cross truck from going into an area. Socioeconomic wars, uh, uh, there, there are all sorts of reasons why people go hungry, but it's not because there's not enough food in the world. And the tragedy is, that this food used to go into omnivores. Today, it just goes into landfills. In fact, in the last 70 years, 70% 70 of all the material that's gone into landfills has been decomposing material. 30% of it food and 40% of it biomass. Folks, that's an unconscionable assault against the earth. It is. If we, if we had been taking all of that decomposable carbon and, and, and just good grief, if, if we had just strewn it on the land, you know, I'm not talking about plastic wrappers and, and, and aluminum foil wrappings, okay? I'm talking about decomposable biomass. If we had just strewn it on the land, it would have been better than putting in landfills. And now we give Greenie Awards for people that are smart enough to figure out how to stick a pipe down in all this absurd anaerobic biomass and, and catch the gas so they can run the garbage trucks to bring the stuff to the land. It's nuts! <laughs> So, you know, where do we, you know, where do we go from here? Well, where we go from here is to try to further integrate the system. We've got, I just was on Bainbridge Island yesterday. And I, I visited half a dozen farms. And every farm I visited, their biggest problem right now in farming is elitist neighbors. who think it's perfectly fine to have a recreational horse. But if you have a chicken or a green bean plant, that's farming. And that's ugly. We've got to get over I mean, I had a lady come up to me recently. She was from Texas and her homeowners association, she had to pay a fine to her homeowners association because they have an anti-farming clause in their you know, homeowners association. And she had the unmitigated gall to plant two tomato plants in her flower bed and had to pay a fine because that's farming. <laughs> you, know, you go to Italy, go to Italy, you know, they don't have these big expansive lawns. They, they, they got a little two foot strip of uh, land between the, you know, between the house and the curb, you know, like on a sidewalk. They got plants there. You know, up along the house, they got trellises, they got cucumbers climbing up all over the house. I mean, China just built a city, 250,000 person city. I don't know where, because I, I, I was at a, doing a seminar and the other speaker was, had just come, he was a college guy and he'd just come back from a trip over there. He had pictures of this city in China and the stipulation of this city, you know, in China they can say, we want a city right here, 250,000 people, build it, you know, right there. And, <laughs> But it was ag land, so the stipulation of the city was that it has to produce the same amount of food as it was producing before the 250,000 person city went in. So, what they did, every single house is five stories tall. I mean, it is China after all. All five stories tall, okay? 
They're all flat roofed. And they went to living roofs on top of all these houses. The guttering goes down into cisterns. They pump the water back up on the top. Now the town, now the city of a quarter million doesn't have, even have a sewer system because all the water gets held in, in, in cisterns until it's needed for the plants up on top. They don't need air conditioning because the plants cascade off the roofs and cool. The, and from, a, from an aerial shot, you couldn't even tell it was a city. I mean, the cucumbers are reaching across the streets, you know, and, and I suppose people, you know, pick watermelons out of their windows and squash and whatever. <laughs> Because it follows these in historic integrated patterns. It's only been in our, you know, abnormal, aberrant era with cheap energy and, and mechanization that we have had the privilege, the luxury of even being logistically able to, for a short period of time, extricate ourselves from these historical more these historical moorings. And it really concerns me that so many people in our culture think that we're going to be the first, most clever, technologically advanced, you know, Star Trekish culture to be able to finally extricate ourselves from these, from this ecological womb, as if as if there's no public, as if there's no profit and loss statement on an ecological balance sheet. And I suggest that that P&L statement from our ecological womb is beginning to start uh, 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 talking a little bit louder to us. You know, does anybody really think at the end of the day that the Dow Jones Industrial Average is more important than happy earthworms? <laughs> You know, I, I, I think on the, on the front of the newspapers, you know, where they have print the, you know, the days of Dow Jones Industrial Average, you know, it goes up and down, you know, they've got this line. I think it'd be good to have, you know, the, the uh, ecological womb average, you know, uh, does it go up and down. And, and, and uh, you know, a Walmart went in, you know, it goes down. <laughs> urban farm goes in, you know, it goes up and, you know, and, you, and have this balance sheet. But, but we don't think about that. Um, we don't think about this, this biological foundation that underpins all of us that we are, every single one of us, completely and utterly dependent on. Previous cultures didn't have a lot of the infrastructure and the cool things that we have today to be able to massage it more appropriately, but at least they couldn't destroy it as fast. <laughs> okay? So, I'm talking about integrated systems and expensive grain again. Well, when grain gets expensive, then we will be, sh we will be pushed more to perennial systems. You know, Perennial systems, you can have, you can have uh, edible landscaping. You know, it doesn't take any longer to grow a flowering uh, bush or tree than it does one that makes fruit after it flowers. You know, medians on highways. You know, we don't need big bat wing mowers going down these highways. Why can't we raise apple trees and pear trees and peach trees down the medians of the highways? You know, you go to Mexico, I was down there in uh, Tlalamipas, went to the, to the city park, it's a beautiful big city park, and they divided it up into six quarters, and I don't know how they dispensed these, I don't know whether it was bribes or lottery or whatever, doesn't matter, but anyway, so six people, six families, have their milk cows in these six quadrants, and that's how they mow the city park, is with these six milk cows. I mean... What, you know, why is, why is that backward? I, I mean, I'm looking at probably the, the, the most segregated thing we've ever done in our culture was the 25-year period during 1950 to about 1975 in which, in which it was considered Neanderthal and barbaric to breastfeed children. 
talk about segre segregated. And you know, I often think, you know, what a, oh, that's probably the worst um, a a atrocious misuse of resources of all those breasts that didn't get used. <laughs> And then here we are today, and suddenly now there are all these reports coming out of the link between you know, breastfeeding and, 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 and how healthy it is in older life, or the stopping breast cancer, and how it builds immune system in babies, and there's this, you know, there's this kind of universal, why did we need, you know, 40 years later for a bunch of taxpayer-funded research to tell us that? <laughs> why couldn't we have just been humble and said, you know, what has sustained civilizations for centuries? Maybe there's some wisdom there. <laughs> One of nature's wisdoms is that nature doesn't move carbon around very much. You ever think about that? About the most nature moves carbon around is, um, is when, a, when an herbivore eats grass over here and poops over there. You know, about as far as an herbivore can walk in a day. That's about as much as carbon gets moved around in nature. Look, folks, poop, I mean, everything moves on poop. I mean, it, you come to my house for dinner, believe me, in 10 minutes we're going to be talking about poop because poop, everything revolves around poop. In fact, the United States today produces enough manures to compensate for every single ounce of chemical fertilizer ever used, but we throw most of it away. Why? Because we've segregated the animals away from the carbon that they're eating. So we produce their food over here, we fertilize it with you know, petroleum over here to be shipped over here to produce their food, to transport it over here to a concentrated animal feeding operation to feed them, in which their manure then becomes so overriding in the ecology of the area that it becomes a toxic waste. And the only way the thing survives is with a routine flood or a hurricane or something once in a while that flushes everything down the river. And then people have the audacity to say, oh, well, you know, you can't feed the world. Well, no, not when you're sending 50% of your manure down the poop down the river. <laughs> but see, before now, we could, never, we could never concentrate this much monoculture, whether it's a fumigated strawberry field in the San Joaquin Valley or whether it's a, 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 a you know a forty thousand head feedlot in in Nebraska, we we could never concentrate that many monoculture mono species in a place at one time because you simply couldn't laboriously bring in enough stuff to keep it going and cart all the stuff out far enough. It, it couldn't be done in ox carts and mule trains and wagon trains, and so. The human capacity to innovate its way into oblivion was held in check, not by our morality or ethics, but simply by the reality of our technology and infrastructure and where we were. Now, we've been able to run clear beyond sustainability with our innovation. And so, you know, because we're pretty clever, I mean, after all, you know, we've got a big brain and opposing thumb. I mean, we're pretty clever. <laughs> and we can invent things that we can't emotionally, spiritually, physically, or environmentally metabolize. You know, um, for 30 years, the U.S. duh. U.S. duh took farmers like me to free steak dinners to teach us this new scientific way of feeding cows. Where we take dead cows and we grind them up and we feed them back to cows. Now, you know, at our farm we didn't adopt this not because we hated the U.S. duh. Although there's no love lost there. 
Not because we were anti-science or anti-progressive, but because we looked all over the world to find a pattern, a template in nature in which herbivores eat carrion and we couldn't find it. And that's why it's important to have our philosophy right, our moral ethical parameters right to protect us from the amoral machinations of an innovative mind that unrestrained can run amok. That My dad used to call that, be careful that you don't overrun your headlights. Because <laughs> we can overrun our headlights. And you know, half of the stuff that, that, that our, our research institutions ask for money to research to solve problems, more than half the problems we created ourselves because we're still wearing our conquistador helmet. I mean, you know, our conquistador uniform, you know, it doesn't look like that. You know, we don't have the funny helmet and the little, you know, little, uh, um, whatever, you know, skirt <laughs> stockings and, and, and the sword. You know, we don't have all that anymore. We, you know, we wear uh, pinstripe suits and maroon ties and pastels and sit in, you know, Wall Street corporate offices. But it's the same mentality. So nature doesn't move carbon very far. When you look at these patterns, it doesn't move carbon very far. The reason that there is no animal-less place on the planet is because animals are the only thing that de can defy gravity in the fertility move of nature. You know, fertility, minerals and, and, and calcium and all these things gradually, and you know, leaves, they, they tend to move downhill. So that's why you have a fertility drain from the hilltops and the hillsides and a fertility buildup down here in these fertile valleys. Well, how are you gonna, how are you gonna balance that out? Animals, because of predators, eat in the fertile valleys well, they don't feel safe in the fertile valleys. You know, I'm down here and I, I can't see. So they want to go lounge up on top of the hill and when they go, so they can look out and see where their enemies are. And while they're there, they poop. <laughs> and that constant movement, anti-gravity, is one of the signal functions of animals on the planet. But nature doesn't move carbon very far routinely. Leaves might blow to a neighbor's yard, okay? It just doesn't move carbon very far. And today, today, with petroleum, we've been able to extricate ourselves from this, from this real-time carbon recycling. So how does nature build soil? You know, before chemical fertilizers, how did nature build soil? Nature built soil in real-time solar activity, solar energy turned into green plants, that then either went through an animal or decomposed on site, preferably through an animal so that it could be deposited uphill, and decomposed, and that fed the actinomycetes and the mycorrhizae and the mycelium and the azotobacter and all the you know, earthworms, all the things in the soil. That's, that's the way it functioned, kind of on site in real time. The function of the herbivore was to prune the plant to stimulate better production. Just like you prune an orchard or prune a vineyard. All right? If you, you know, grass grows in a sigmoid curve. You know, I'll see the S curve, okay, the S curve. I call this down here diaper grass. This is teenage grass. This is nursing home grass. All right? <laughs> if we want the forage to metabolize the greatest amount of solar energy into green material of those three phases, where do we want to keep the grass most of the time? Teenage, thank you. Yes, teenage, don't be so timid. It's all right, teenage grass. If, if you keep it in infant stage, it can never really build up a head of steam. You know, it never gets off the starting blocks. If you let it go ungrazed and tip over into senescence, it all turns brown and just turns down and, and the photosynthetic activity shuts down. So the herbivore is nature's biomass accumulation restart button. Okay? Just like the restart button on your computer. All right? 
to restart that fast metabolic capacity. We have a lot of thinking in our culture today that, that um, the best ecology, uh, the, the best land management uh, policy is land management uh, based on human abandonment. That if all of us would just, you know, have a heart attack today, the planet would be a lot better off. Well, that doesn't sit very well with me. <laughs> I find that a hard sell in a lot of places. And as an idea marketer, I just don't like to market that idea. So the question is then, now, now, and I'm quick to repent in sackcloth and ashes for all the damage that humans have done and herbivores have done and tillage has done. And all, you know, okay, we've done a lot of damage, right? But what are we supposed to do? Why do we have this big brain that's opposing thumb? I would suggest that what we're here for, one of the things we're here for, is to take this intellectual, innovative capacity and bring it humbly to this marvelous creation and massage the ecological womb in the right spots to create the right disturbance to stimulate greater solar conversion into biomass decomposable accumulation than nature would accumulate in a static state. That's one of our functions. And so how do we move that biomass accumulation forward? Well, we integrate. We're back to integration. We're back to urban farms. We're back to um, taking the 35 million acres of lawn in the U.S. 35 million acres of lawn. And creating edible landscapes rather than inedible landscapes. We've got 36 million acres housing and feeding recreational horses. That's 71 million acres. That's enough to feed the entire country without a single farm. If every kitchen in America had enough chickens attached to it to eat the kitchen scraps, there would be no egg industry in the United States. You know, the, uh, the Humane Society could shut down and go home. We wouldn't even have to talk about animal factories, you see, if we had integrated systems. And that's the way you gradually increase and ratchet up the production and you use this human capacity to innovate and create and return to normality. See, a lot of people, you know, they, they, they think this normal thing, well, uh, you know, we don't want to go back to ringer washers and, and hoop skirts and, and, you know, horse and buggy and Dutch oven cooking and all this stuff. Well, I don't want to go back there either. We're not going to go back there. We're going to go confidently into the future taking the technology that we have. You know, when people come to our farm, you know, they say, oh, this is like Grandpa's farm. Boy, I mean, I, I kick them. No, I don't kick them off the farm. I say, this isn't Grandpa's farm. Grandpa would have given his eye teeth for the things we've got today. I mean, we've got, we've got computer microchip energizers. When I was a kid, we had the, the uh, electric fence energizers were very crude and they, they scavenged the points and condensers out of the car. The points on it were boing, boing, boing. They made, a, they made a spark length that was half a second long and melted anything plastic that came along to it because there was so much resistance in the line due to putting this very low voltage but high amperage long extended amount of energy through. Today, we've been able to, with computer microchips, we've been able to shorten, in solid states, we've been able to shorten down that spark length to four thousandths of a second, increase the voltage by a factor of ten, and run it in almost invisible hair-sized metal filaments on polyethylene netting to make fences 
that 150 feet of it only weighs 12 pounds. One person can take it up and put it down in 10 minutes and it keeps out wolves, bears, coyotes, dogs, possums, skunks, and keeps chickens and turkeys in. How cool is that? <laughs> the point I'm making is that humans, civilization, has never had the level, the kind of infrastructure we have today to allow us for the first time to so magnificently massage this womb in ways we've never been able to do before. Think about it, you know, 200 years ago, if you wanted to have, you know, uh, 300 cows and move them every day from paddock to paddock, how are you going to do that? You know, Thomas Jefferson had, uh, had hurdles. You know, they made these 10-foot-long gate hurdles, you know. And they could use those for a milk cow or something. But for a herd, you know, to, what are you going to do? Take, you know, take a crew of 500 out there to set up a, you know, a, a, a five-acre gate? No, now, you know, now we just, you can take all the fencing we need to, to run a thousand cow operation and, and put it in a wheelbarrow. You know, we're to Kevin Kelly, the editor of Wired Magazine, who talked about the new rules for the new economy and everything's being downsized, restructured, and miniaturized. You know, 100, 100 years ago, you couldn't build structures with light lad using high-tech uh, CAD drawing engineering to create the, the least amount of, of materials. Uh, you know how much wood went into a log cabin? Why did you use a log cabin? Why not use, you know, stud framing and, and, and simple little lath and bamboo and stuff? Well, it's because, it's because sawmills took a quarter of an inch kerf and cuts were so expensive to make and lost so much wood, you wanted to minimize cuts. You wanted to maximize the diameter of wood and minimize the kind of wood that you use. So it was a very resource uh, uh, um, resource using kind of thing. Today we have bandsaw mills that run on 20 horsepower Honda engines sitting on portable bandsaw mills weighed 800 pounds. You can pull it behind your Honda Civic right to the trees so you let the log drop, you mill it right on site, don't have to put it on a truck and take it up a road anywhere and suddenly you're in the lumber business with a kerf that's only a tenth of an inch so now you can cut little half inch lath all day and have a little pile of uh, 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 sawdust and fill a five gallon bucket. You know, these are exciting times, so now we can make portable farms. Our whole farm can be portable. You can put it on rented land, owned land, a neighbor's land, you know, the backside of the forest service, squatted land, whatever. But <laughs> the whole farm can be portable. We've, we've never been able to do that before. And what it allows us to do is create the level of integrated complex synergy that nature does in natural systems and practice a level of biomimicry that we've never been able to do before. See, the other side, the Monsantos of the world, they look at us, and, and if there's a Monsanto plant in here, um, um, just be quiet. Uh, <laughs> The Monsantos, they don't realize that our side, we've not been sitting on our hands since the you know, turn of the 1900s. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that Sir Albert Howard brought scientific aerobic composting to the world right about the same time, 1943, when we were getting chemical fertilizer as a way to use up the uh, stockpiles of ammunition from World War II. And, um, and, and we, our side hasn't been sitting still. All you got to do is go in here and visit these exhibits and you're, and you're seeing amazing new, you know, niche kind of production things and, and rooftop and new, you know, honeybee uh, houses and, and, and yarn and wool. And, and, and so, so, what we desperately need, I'm about done, what we desperately need is we don't need more resources, we don't need more money, we don't need more people in this thing. What we need is more participation. We don't, we don't lack for money, ideas, we don't lack for people, we don't lack for, for, for resources. Our big weak link is constipation of imagination. 
And so what we need to do is begin participating in this wonderful choreographed dance with this, with this invisible world of actinomycetes and the three trillion member internal community in our own bodies that don't want to eat unpronounceable food. They, you know, they, they want to eat something that they can recognize. They got to have a, you know, a big uh, uh, summit every time some unpronounceable thing comes down there. You know, 150 years ago, we didn't, we, we weren't able to make high fructose corn syrup. We weren't able to make MSG, red dye 29, and all the other, you know, pseudo Monsanto, Cargill, adulterated, prostituted, reconstituted, amalgamated fecal soup. this stuff. Today we can. And so I wish that I could snap my fingers and the soil would heal, the earthworms would dance, our food would be nutrient dense, leukemia would go away, diabetes would go away, obesity would go away, Wall Street would go away. Uh, uh, <laughs> I wish I could snap my fingers, you know, and, and, and a lot of things would change. But you know what? We are, our culture is today, a physical manifestation of billions and billions and billions of little day-to-day -day decisions that we've made up until now. And in 20 years, that's going to repeat itself. And what we desperately need now is for all of us to begin participating in this and realizing it's not up to... Her and him and them and they and those people, it's up to us. And if we don't lead by example, then where are the other people going to follow? We are the normal people historically, societally, and culturally. And we need to appreciate we've been given the antidote because of our philosophy, because we're here at Mother Earth News Fair, we have the antidote for restoring the glue and the, and the reasonableness and, the, and the, the, the normalcy that has kept nature operating and civilizations operating for a long time. So as we, as we take, so I anoint you with that mantle of, of both opportunity and responsibility. Let's go from this place. <laughs> Blessed to be able at this time to participate in this great healing process that we need to bring to our culture and our earth. God help us to do it. Now, may all of your carrots grow long and straight. <laughs> may all of your radishes be large and not pithy. <laughs> May the coyotes be struck blind at your pastured chickens. May all of your culinary experiments be delectable. May all of your canning jars seal. May the rain fall gently on your fields. The wind be always at your back. Your children rise up and call you blessed, and may we all make this a better world than we found. Thank you very much. Blessed.